Anthony Prothero. She kept a small post office in the neighbourhood of Bow. She loved a skilled mechanic who was famous in his day. A gentle executioner whose name was Gilbert Clay. Ah, now, I, I think I hear you say, a dreadful subject for your rhymes. Oh, audience, do not shrink. He did not live in modern times. He lived so long ago, his garb will show it at a glance, that all his actions glitter with the limelight of romance. And when his work was over, they would rumble all the lead. And sit beneath the frontage of an elderberry tree. And Annie's gentle prattle entertained him on their walk, for public executions formed the subject of their talk. And sometimes he'd explain to her... Which charmed her very much. How famous operators vary very much in touch. <laughs> and then perhaps he'd show how he himself performed the trick and illustrate his meaning with a poppy and a stick. <laughs> If it rained, the gentle lass would stay inside and look at his favourable notices, all pasted in a book. And then her cheek would flush, her swimming eyes would dance with joy in a glow of admiration for the prowess of her boy. One summer eve, at supper time, the gentle Gilbert said, as he helped his pretty Annie to a slice of pollard head, that reminds me, I must settle on the next ensuing day the hash of that unmitigated villain, Peter Gray. He saw his Annie tremble, and he saw his Annie start. Her changing colour trumpeted the flutter of her heart. Young Gilbert's manly bosom rose and sank with jealous fear, and he said, Oh, gentle Annie, what is the meaning of this here? Annie answered, a colour rising in, in an eyes. interesting way, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, so right, I was going to say, I'm just about to say that, yeah, blushing yeah. in an interesting way. You think, no doubt, I'm sighing for that fellow Peter Gray. That I was his young woman is unquestionably true, but not since I began a keeping company with you. Then Gilbert, who was irritable, rose and loudly swore, I shall know the reason why if you refuse to tell me more. Annie answered, a look of anger darting from her eyes, You shall ask no questions, and you shall be told no lies. Few lovers have the privilege enjoyed, my dear, by you, of chopping off a rival's head and quarrying him too. Of vengeance, dear, tomorrow you will surely have your fill. And Gilbert ground his molars as he answered her, I will. <laughs> Young Gilbert left the table with a stern, determined look, and frowning took an inexpensive hatchet from its hook. And Annie watched his movements with an interested air. For the morrow, for the morrow, he was going to prepare. He chopped it with a hammer. And he chipped it with a bill. He poured sulfuric acid on the edge of it until this terrible avenger of the majesty of law was far less like a hatchet than a dissipated saw. <laughs> oh, Gilbert! Oh, my Gilbert, dear, I do not understand. Why ever have you injured that there hatchet in your hand? It is intended, Annie, for to lacerate and flay the neck of that unmitigated villain, Peter Gray. Oh, Gilbert! Annie answered. Wicked husband, just beware! I won't have Peter tortured with the other one affair. If you appear with that, you may depend you'll rue the day. Then Gilbert said, Oh, shall I? Which was just his nasty way. He saw a look of anger from her eyes distinctly dart, for Annie was a woman who had pity in her heart. She bade him a... Good evening. He answered with a glare. Glare! She only said, Remember, for your Annie will be there. Now, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we require the help of an exciting, dashing young man who perhaps feels a clear head of his life and would like to end it in a very public way. Well, no, of course not, of course not. Come this way, come this way. You just stand behind this, uh, this chair here. This serves our execution block. Don't worry, just stand there. It's perfectly safe. Uh, well, um, it's quite safe. Well, anyway, don't worry about it. Just relax and enjoy your last moments. Uh, we'll be back in a second. Thank you very much. The morrow, Gilbert boldly on the scaffold took his stand. 
with a visor on his face and with a hatchet in his hand. And all the people noticed that this engine of the law was far less like a hatchet than a dissipated sword. The villain very coolly loosed his collar and his stock. Now that's your shirt and tie. Well, you're a bit casual today, anyway. It should be fine. It's just so I can get the blade in. See, nothing sinister, nothing sinister. And placed his wicked head upon the handy little block. I said, would you like to put your head just there, just so I can chop it easy, you see? Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Just put your head down, that's it, this is fine, it's no problem. That's it, no, all the way down, if possible. There we go. The hatchet was uplifted for to settle Peter Gray when Gilbert plainly heard a woman's voice exclaiming, Stay! It was Annie. Gentle Annie, as you easily believe. Oh, Gilbert, you must spare him, for I bring him a reprieve. Well, isn't that lucky? You must know the poem, so well done. There we are. <laughs> I, it came from the Home Secretary many weeks ago and passed it up post office that I used to run at Bow. I loved you. Lo Excuse me if you could stand back a little here. Thank you very much. I loved you. <laughs> Love you madly. And you know it, Gilbert Clay. And as I quite surrendered all idea of Peter Gray, I quietly suppressed it, as you'll clearly understand, because I thought it might be awkward if he came and claimed my hand. In anger at my secret, which I could not tell before, to last week, poor Peter Gray, vindictively, you swore. I told you if you use that blunted axe, you'd rue the day. And so you will, young Gilbert, for I'll marry Peter Gray. <laughs> Would you mind uh, reading this uh, out, uh, sir, in a good loud voice? Thank you. And she did. And that is legally binding, ladies and gentlemen. There we are. Congratulations. A big round of applause for Steve, ladies and gentlemen. said to me, Reginald, I think it is time you began to think about choosing a profession. These were ominous words. Having left Eton a year earlier, I had spent my time very pleasantly and very idly, and I was sorry to think that my long holiday was drawing to a close. A father had hoped to send me to Cambridge, a tradition in our family, but business had been somewhat depressed of late, and a sentence of six months' hard labour has straightened my forefathers' resources considerably. It had become necessary, highly necessary, for me to choose a calling. With a sigh of resignation, I admitted as much. If you like, I may take you in hand and teach you my profession, uh, and in a few years, perhaps, I may take you into partnership. But uh, to be candid, I doubt whether it is a satisfactory calling for an athletic young fellow like you. I don't seem to care for it particularly. I'm glad to hear it. It's a poor calling for a young man of spirit. Besides, you must grow grey in the service before people will listen to you. Now, I should like to consult your own taste on so important a matter as the choice of a profession. What do you say? The army? You don't seem to care much for the army. Forgery? The bar? Cornish wrecking? Father, I should like to be a forger, but I write with such an infernal hand, it is all I'm able to do to forge my own signature, let alone anybody else's. <laughs> Anybody's else? You should say, not anybody else's. It's a dreadful barbarism, neat in English. Well, I should never make my fortune at it. And as for wrecking, well, <laughs> you know how seasick I am. You might get over that. Besides, you would deal with wrecks ashore, not wrecks at sea. Well, most of it's done in small boats, I'm told. No, there's a deal of small boat work. I shan't be a wrecker. I think... I think I should like to be... a burglar. Yes! Yes! It's a fine, manly profession. But it's dangerous. It's highly dangerous. Just dangerous enough to make it exciting. Nothing more. Well, 
If you have a distinct taste for burglary, I shall see what can be done. My dear father was always prompt with pen and ink, and that very night wrote to his old friend, Ferdinand Stoneley, a burglar of the very highest professional reputation. Within a week, I was duly and formally indentured to him with a view to ultimate partnership. I had to work hard under Mr. Stoneley. Burglary is a jealous mistress. She will tolerate no rivals. She demands the undivided devotion of her worshippers. But <laughs> study hard, follow my instruction, and you shall find her highly rewarding. Every morning at 10 o'clock, I would present myself at his chambers in New Square, Lincoln's Inn. And until 12, I would help his assistant with the correspondence. From 12 until 2, we would go out prospecting. And then from 2 until 4, I would devote myself to getting up all the particulars necessary for the scientific burglary of any given household. At first, this was done merely for practice, with no view to an actual attempt. Uh, here's what to start you off with. Now I happen to know all the particulars of that abode, but that is no matter. You are to go there, ascertain all about the house and its inmates, their coming and going, whether there are a number of servants, whether any of them are male, and if so, whether any of them sleep in the basement or not, and other details necessary to be known before a burglary may be safely attempted. Then you are to return here, or to compare your information with my own, and compliment or blame you as you might deserve. You got that? I think so, Mr. Stoney, yes. Oh, then, off your trot. He was a hard master, but always kind, just and courteous, as became a highly polished gentleman of the old school. After about a year's probation, I went with him on some expeditions and had the happiness of thinking I was some little use to him. I shot him eventually in the stomach, having mistaken him for the master of a house into which we were breaking. He died upon the grand piano. His dying wish was to convey to me his compliments. Stoneley left no heirs, and his fortune, some £12,000, he left to the Society for Providing More Bishops. His papers, memoranda, ledgers and daybooks generally, he left to me. I now set up on my own account and wasted no time commencing my professional duties. I looked through his papers to find a suitable house to begin upon single-handed and came across the following highly suitable entry. <coughs> house. Number 110, Furlow Square. Occupant. One John Davies, bachelor, designer of day -dos. 86 years old, very feeble and eccentric, snores. Servants. Pretty housemaid called Rachel, Church of England, open to attentions, snores. Ugly housemaid called Bella, primitive Methodist, open to attentions, snores. Elderly cook, Presbyterian, open to attentions, snores. Practical approach. Third room, ground floor window, bar has no catch, can be open with a table knife. Valuable articles. Silver presentation plate. Etc, etc. Well, this seemed to me to be a capital house to begin upon single-handed. And that very night, at midnight, excuse me while I put on my burglar's hat, I packed in my burglar's briefcase the following. <clears throat> Two crowbars, a bunch of skeleton keys, a centre bit, a dark lantern, a box of silent matches, some putty, a life preserver, and a knife, and I set off for Thurlow Square. I remember it had been snowing heavily with a foot of snow upon the ground and uh, more to come. Poor Stoneley's particulars were correct in every detail. I was able to gain entry to the third window on the ground story without any difficulty. I made my way to the dining room. There, sure enough, was the presentation plate. About 800 ounces, at my reckoning. Ahem. I heard a slight cough behind me. Turning, I saw a dear old sweet silver-haired gentleman in his dressing gown standing in the doorway. He was covering me with his revolver. My first thought was to rush at and bring him with my life preserver. Don't move, or you're a dead man. 
a rather silly comment occurred to me to the effect that if I did move, it would rather prove I was a live man, uh, but I dismissed it at once as being unsuitable to the business character of the interview. You're a burglar. I have that honour, I said, reaching for my revolver pocket. Don't move! I have often wished to have the pleasure of encountering a burglar in order to be able to test a favourite theory of mine as to how persons of that class should be dealt with. But you mustn't move. Well, I should be happy to assist you, if I may do so in a way consistent to my own safety. Uh, promise me uh, I will be allowed to leave the house when your little experiment is in there. If you obey me promptly, you shall be at perfect liberty to leave. You will neither hand me over to custody nor make any attempt to pursue me? On my honour! as a designer of dados. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, carry on. First, <clears throat> firm, stretch out your arms at right angles to your body. Uh, supposing I don't. Then I send a bullet through your left ear. <laughs> I hardly think that. Ah! Ah! Oh! Oh! Ah, ah, a ball took off the lobe of my left ear. The ear smarted, and, and I should have liked to attend to it, but uh, under the circumstances, I thought it better to comply with the eccentric old gentleman's wishes. Very good. Now, do as I tell you, promptly and without a moment's hesitation, or I shall cut off the lobe of your right ear. Now, uh, throw me your life preserver. Oh, must I? Ah, would you? The uh, click settled me. Besides, the, the old gentleman's whimsicality amused me, and I was interested to see how far it would carry him. Uh, now, take off your jacket and throw it to me. And the whiskers. Boots! Um, these are... Shoes. I said with some temerity, not wishing to uh, cause offence where really no offence was intended. Shoes then. Uh, trousers. Oh now, come. Ow! Oh! Ah! Off came the right earlobe. <laughs> For all his eccentricity, uh, the old gentleman was a man of his word. He had my trousers, and with them, my revolver, which happened to be in the right hand pocket. Ah, the rest of your drapery. Uh. Shush, it's bad enough. <laughs> Thank you. I shan't detain you any longer. What? What? You promised me our liberty. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Really, I hardly know. But, but, but what is to become of me? Really, I hardly know. to deal with. I couldn't possibly go home as I was, but if I remained here, I was certain to be taken into custody in the morning. For some time, I searched in vain to find something to cover myself with. All the hats and greatcoats doubtless being locked in the inner hallway. At any rate, they were inaccessible under the current circumstances. There was a carpet upon the floor, but it was fitted to the extremities of the room. Uh, besides, a heavy sideboard stood upon it. There were, however, twelve chairs in the room, and it was with no little delight I realised there was an antimacassar on the back of each. Twelve antimacassars would go a long way towards covering myself, and that was something. I, I did my best with the antimacassars, uh, but on reflection, I concluded that they, they didn't help very much. I mean, certainly they, they covered me. Uh, but any gentleman walking through South Kensington at two in the morning, through more than two feet of snow, wearing only antimacassars, was sure to attract attention. I grew very cold. Looking out of the window, I saw the bullseye of a policeman bobbing up and down as he trudged wearily through the snow. I felt I had no choice 
but to surrender myself to him. I say, policeman, a word! Anything wrong, sir? Uh, yes. I've been committing a burglary in this house and would be very grateful if you'd be so kind as to take me into custody. <sighs> Nonsense, sir, you better go to bed. No, I should like nothing better. But I live near Lincoln's Inn and uh, I'm wearing nothing whatever but antimacassars. I am almost frozen. I pray you take me into custody. Street doors open, please come in. With great difficulty, I persuaded him that I was in earnest. And the good fellow covered me with his own greatcoat. Oh, in ten minutes, I was thawing myself in Malton Street Police Station. In ten days, I was convicted at the Old Bailey. In ten years, I was returning from penal servitude. Upon my return, I found that poor Mr. Davis had gone to his long bed in the Brompton graveyard. I never passed by his house without a terrible shudder at the memory of the terrible, awful hours I'd spent there as his guest. For many years, I tried to forget the incident I'd been relating to you, and for a long time, without success. However, perseverance met with its reward. I continued to try. Gradually, one detail after another slipped from my memory until one lovely evening last May. I realized to my intense delight that I'd completely forgotten all about it. Thank you.